So MJ, here we are, getting ready to start our next episode of Dig In. And you know what we're gonna start with? What would that be? Some short division. <laughs> that is true. We are gonna be at Iris for you, dividing irises today. We're at Hudson Gardens. We're at a huge new project called the Consulate House. Oh that boy. I know you're gonna love. And then we finish the show with our favorite man. The Chef Mick is gonna make something delicious. So stay tuned for all of that today on Dig In. Dig In is brought to you by Tagawa Gardens. 110,000 feet of indoor space with an oasis of lush gardens and plants. Tagawa Gardens is family owned with on staff experts helping our community choose the best annuals, perennials, bushes, trees, and so much more. Tagawa Gardens in Centennial, 7711 South Parker Road, helping our community grow and be green for over 30 years. TagawaGardens.com on Dig In. So Keith, today we are at one of Colorado Front Range's most amazing little best kept secrets. It is a little hidden treasure right here in Denver on Absolutely. South Santa Fe. I feel kind of bad that we've never really been here to film the show because it's just gorgeous. A lot of beautiful display gardens. I, I just was looking at the map and there's rose gardens and water gardens and perennial cutting gardens and you name it, they've got it. And they actually also have great facilities for anybody who's looking for a location to have a wedding or hold some sort of function in a beautiful landscape and backdrop. And a lot of kids stuff to do too. So this is a perfect place, but we're gonna get a closer look with Melanie from Heads and Gardens, the education manager. We're a regional display garden, meaning that everything that we demonstrate at Hudson Gardens can be grown successfully in Colorado. And so the purpose of our gardens is really to show homeowners what they can grow in their own homes and gardens. We have a lot of different display gardens for them. Um, we have a combination of formal manicured gardens as well as more natural areas. And so um, we showcase perennials, annuals, trees, shrubs, some of our display gardens um, are pretty unique. We have a rose garden. We have um, water features with water lilies. We just kind of run the gamut with um, a bunch of different types of um, gardens that you could possibly incorporate into your own homes. We have 30 acres. South Suburban owns the property. We're managed by a foundation, the Hudson Foundation, and so um, we are the caretakers of the property, but it's owned by South Suburban. We're very family friendly. We have a lot of activities for kids to do down here. Um, but we invite people to come down to the gardens and just stroll through our gardens. We're not a scientific facility, we're more about nature appreciation. Um, and so if you're coming for a garden visit, just bring your family on down. You can stay as long as you'd like. Stroll through our gardens, pick up a family explorer pack so that you can explore a little, um, some of the aspects of the gardens a little bit more deeply. Um, but we're very family friendly, laid back here. We're primarily known for our weddings and concerts. Um, but we also host a series of classes. Um, our most recent partnership is with the Garden Centers of Colorado, and so we have a series on vegetable gardening. Um, we have a fabulous beekeeping program, and we also partner with various local organizations to offer other gardening classes. So um, we partner with Columbine Design to do some landscape um, design classes. We have rose classes with the Denver Rose Society, and so we have a lot of opportunities for gardeners to expand their knowledge as well. We have partnered with Scott's miracle Grow. We actually received a grant that earlier this spring to put in a songbird garden at Hudson Gardens. And so what we're going to do there is we're going to create a songbird habitat using nat uh, native plants and shrubs to attract songbirds. Um, we'll kick it off this fall and we're very excited about that. We have some other birding um, opportunities that we've released this fall or this um, previous spring. So coupled with our songbird garden, we're hoping to promote Hudson Gardens as a songbird habitat as well. So the biggest difference between our water features is the lined bottom. Um, we have some, some manicured garden features up towards the north end of our property, including our brand new Victoria water lily pond, um, man-made. All of our features here are man-made except with the exception of the wetlands. Um, but down here right behind us we have our lotus garden, our water garden. We grow water lotus there and it has a natural bottom to the pond and so everything grows in the muck at the bottom of the pond rather than in pots. Where we're sitting right now is called Monet's Place. It's the site of um, 
quite a few wedding ceremonies that we hold throughout the year. We have 350 private events that are held at Hudson Gardens um, year round, but the site that we're sitting in right now is Monet's Place. It was renovated in 2009, and so all the plantings that you see surrounding us mimic those that are growing in Monet's Garden in France. Um, the exception is that all of the plants that we've chosen for this garden grow successfully in Colorado, and so we're continuing on with the regional display garden theme, even through our ceremony sites. We'd love to have you come to Hudson Gardens. We have a ton of things for you to see and do. Um, more information is on our website at www.hudsongardens.org. Um, we're right in the heart of Littleton, right across from Arapahoe Community College on Santa Fe, so I hope that you can come see us soon. So MJ, here we are at Hudson Gardens in their prairie meadow landscaped area, which is absolutely gorgeous. Look at all the flowers blooming. You can hear the birds in the background. And oddly enough, this is the place where there's going to be a bird sanctuary, a songbird sanctuary installed in cooperation with Scots. And you'll want to keep, uh, keep tuned to the show to watch the progression of that in more details. Keith, you know, the best part and sometimes the worst part about Colorado is it's sunny all morning long and sometimes we get some amazing afternoon thunderstorms. Well, yeah, just recently we had some hail and it did a little bit of damage here and there and we had a lot of people asking us questions of exactly how to handle that in the yard, what's still good, what isn't, what you should clean up and so forth. And my advice is clean it up as quickly as you can. Go through on your vegetable gardens and your perennials. If you've got chewed up leaves like this, take them off. If there's still more leaf that's green than damaged, leave it on so the plant can recover. And by all means, do not fertilize your plants to try to force them Common to recover. Mistake. Yep, you never want to fertilize a plant that's under stress. Once you see the new growth coming, you can feed them. But a lot of your plants, your squash, your tomatoes, peppers, a lot, most of your perennials, you clean up the broken material, they'll bounce right back. It's still early in the season. You'll be surprised how quickly they recover. And who knows, we may still have another episode. That's true. We just, just say, hell no. <laughs> we don't talk about the ice balls, which must not be named. Hi, right, this is Chef Mick from Tony's Markets. Today we're going to learn everything we can about artichokes and we're going to stuff them full of shrimp remoulade coming up on Dig In Colorado. Dig In with Keith Funk, MJ Engel, and Chef Nick Rosacci. Join us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. Get the links at digincolorado.com. Hudson Gardens was gorgeous. They have a mix of beautiful perennials and annuals that bloom all summer long. But here I'm with Bob Van Leer with Iris for You. It's a beautiful iris garden. I mean, talk about a niche plant. You have decided on one plant and you're going to go with that. This is a commercial iris farm. And Bob, you have what, two and a half acres here? You two said? and a half acres. And it's all iris. It's the most spectacular thing you've ever seen when it's in full bloom in May and early June. Correct. Isn't that usually when Correct. it happens? Peak bloom is normally the last week of May. Yeah, not, not this year. Not this year. No. <laughs> it was way early this year. I remember that. But one of the questions we get asked a lot is how and when do you dig up and divide an iris and why would you do it? When you're going to want to dig up the iris is about middle of July, about eight to ten weeks after it's finished flowering. So uh, eight weeks after it's finished flowering. So from, say, the end of May month of you got And why do June. we want to wait that period of time? Because there's no roots on the plant. Okay. But ideally you want it to establish a new root system for the existing fan that's there. It that okay. doesn't produce a flower. So what we're going to do is dig up this clump. Now as I recall one of the reasons that you want to do this is about every three to five years these plants are going to get really crowded and they may not bloom as well. That's that's correct. They're, they're also 
may even develop that, that, that dead center. Sometimes you see iris clumps that just have a ring of living around the outside and it's dead in the middle. And you told me that's waiting too long. Waiting too long. So <clears throat> as you can see here, this is the old root system that supported the old rhizome. Okay, so it's kind of shriveled and dark. It'll, it'll eventually rot off and then you'll have holes on the bottom of the rhizome. Where the roots used to be attached. Where the roots used to be. That's not where bugs went in. Ex exactly. <laughs> okay. That, that's just part of the plant. Uh huh. So, well, let's take this over to the table so people can <laughs> be ruthless. You are ruthless, I tell you what. So, you want to discard the old rhizome. There might be an eye or two left on there. It's hardly worth Hardly worth saving. Yeah. You know, as a homeowner, you're, you're only going to have so much room. So, <clears throat> You just break them off. No sanitation involved here, folks. It's just take them apart. Take them apart, throw that old, old well, here's, here's a good example of the new root system. See, this fan didn't bloom, and here's the new root system is produced, and that's what you want to maintain. You want to secure that into the ground as soon as you can, and it'll continue growing and establish the plant, so it will probably bloom again next year, right? Correct, and this root system has been established since the flower stopped flowering. Okay. This is all new uh, since uh, middle of May. Sure. So it's nice and vigorous it's, and you can you can tell it's new because it's a very light color. It's very flexible and it feels very moist. But I think it's interesting the way you've, you you just don't leave any of this old tuber Correct. Throw that on away. here. This old rhizome. It's not a bulb, it's a rhizome. Rhizome. And the, what makes it different is it's a modified stem. Correct. So, rather, than a, a, rather than a true bulb like an onion would be. <clears throat> All right, so, so you're I, all set ideal, here. Ideally, you know, we're going to wait another couple, two, three, four weeks, so the rhizome here is actually going to be bigger okay. when you actually transplant. And you don't want to save everything. Every, these That's not little, worth it, is it? Yeah, put these in a bag and put them on your sidewalk. Yeah, give them to your neighbors, right? Give them to your neighbors. <laughs> and yours will always look better, so you... Well, I'm just better grower than you are, right? Yeah. So, so now, what do you do with this fan? So... We're going to cut it, leaving about six inches. Yeah, it's about six to six eight inches. Inch, uh -huh. Six to eight inches. Just so you don't forget, you want to write down the name. But, so this was Dusky Challenger. Okay. So you got the, the end, the heel. You want to cut it off, make nice a smooth cut. cut. Yeah. Let it sit overnight. Let it callus over before okay. you replant. And that keeps out? Well, rot and things rot, like that? Rot, yeah. Okay. You know, it's going to form a scab. Well, like a potato would. Correct. Okay. So. Now, repotting or re replanting these, let's pretend like these have sat overnight. So, you're going to go back in and prepare your soil. You want to incorporate some uh, fresh compost into your, into your ground. You're going to want to incorporate some triple superphosphate. A handful of it in the planting hole? Yeah, I think two pounds per hundred square feet. Okay. You know, so it so doesn't take that much. It doesn't take that much. But when you put it in, don't just put it at the base of the plant. Put it all around in that area where you're planting. And dig it in, right? And dig it in. Okay. The triple superphosphate has to be incorporated into the soil because it doesn't leach into the ground in its in its So it needs to form. be where the roots are going to be. Correct. All right. So now how you put those in the ground? How deeply do they go? Because there's a lot of controversy about that. Well, not controversy, but a lot of questions, a lot of confusion, I guess I should say. So you want to plant about at least a minimum of 12 inches. 18 inches is better. 18 inches apart. Okay. And a little trick to, um, when you plant, turn the fans at angles to each other so the rhizome heats up a little bit slower so you get a little bit delayed flowering. Okay. If you planted them all in the same direction, they're all going to warm up at the same amount of time and then flower all at the same time. So, okay. you know. If, well, and if you plant them all facing it outward, your rhizomes will grow outward rather than well, into Well, yeah, in, and, you're, in and by doing that, you're, you're, you're putting them on different angles. Yeah. So, since they're a rhizome, not a bulb, you want to, in Colorado, we want to plant them just below the soil Surface, just below. Just below. Okay. Just barely cover. 
the rhizome. It's very tempting to want to plant these things. People think of them as a bulb. Well, they got to go four to six inches deep, and that's not the case. If you do that, you'll never get a flower off of these things. And iris also like a lot of sun. Si at least six hours. At least six hours. You can see here, we get... Well, you get it all day. All day long. Yeah. You know, so the rhizome is just barely below the surface level. And you've given them lots of room to grow here. Well, I mean, you... we're a little tighter here than normally would, but, okay. you know, uh, you want to plant them about 18 inches apart. All right. Well, that's good information. We appreciate that. Now, is it also the time that you would uh, add some regular garden fertilizer, or is the triple... For the... I think the triple superphosphate initially to help establish a root system. Okay. Um, once you s see that center fan coming out, you'll know that the plant has been established. Mm -hmm. uh, it's starting to grow. You can also give it a little tug, and if it's firm, it's you firm. know, it's growing. So once you get them in the ground, water them in well. You don't need to mulch them. They like to have the sun baking on the soil. They need they? the summer heat to set the flower for next year. Okay, so don't put mulch over the top of them. And we'll only water them when they get a little on the dry side. Though. On the dry side. Let, them, let the roots go out and find the water. Okay, excellent. Now, there are a lot of other plants that need to be divided in the garden at certain times of year. Iris happen to be in, in an unusual situation where you're dividing them in the middle of the summer. Most of your perennials like what? Like daylilies and, and daisies and phlox and your typical perennials will be best divided in early spring when you see just a little bit of new growth on them. Uh, you, typically that's what? Early April, mid-April, that sort of thing. Or even, I think, mid-March. If, if you can get in there that early. In, yeah. 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 That's the best time to, to uh, divide those plants and again set them at the same depth that you, they, you took them out of the ground. And add a little compost, add a little superphosphate, maybe even some garden fertilizer when you're replanting to get them off to a good start. So that concludes our iris demonstration for today. I really appreciate it, Bob. Thank you Thank for you showing Keith. us all your little tips and tricks there. Uh, make sure you come and visit Bob here at iris for you uh, Your visiting hours, are they done for the year? We're finished. Garden visitation is finished, but the website's open until the end of July. There you go. So check out the website, place your order if you want some of those beautiful iris. I know I did. I'm looking forward to getting my plants here. Dig in with Keith Funk, MJ Angle, and Chef Nick Rosacci. Join us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. Get the links at digincolorado.com. Hi, my name is Jason. I'm with Lowe's. And for today's Dig Info, I want to talk about how to cross-pollinate fruit trees. Now normally cross-pollination between fruit trees occurs with two fruit trees in order to bear fruit. Pollination occurs naturally, usually between insects like bees. And that's your Dig Info this week, brought to you by Lowe's in Westminster. So Keith, you know, I've been accused a time or two of thinking big. Yeah, you have, and I I'm kinda hate to ask you, what did you get us into? Well, this residence used to be a governmental consulate, and so we've mm -hmm. decided to renovate this entire landscape. We? We! You got a mouse in your pocket? No, it's just you and me. Oh, great. We okay. are going to bring in the contractors and work on this project and show people every step of the way what's going to have to be done to this home to transform it into something that's going to be more usable and updated. Well, but this is such a spectacularly large scale. I mean, it's going to be fun. You're going to see lots of great ideas and so forth. But how are we going to scale this down for a normal backyard? The best part about this project is when we resurface the patio area, mm -hmm. we're going to be doing a huge scale. But if you have a small patio area, we're going to show you the steps necessary to complete that project. And I suppose that could be applicable to just about anything we do in this yard. We can make it work for the average backyard. Exactly. Like we have some planter boxes in the backyard. When we build those, we talk about the plants that need to go in them. Those ideas could be taken home to any homeowner. Well, you know, along the way, I think you can be guaranteed some spectacular ideas that uh, could be utilized in your own yard. So we are very excited to announce the consulate project that will be going on for the next year. It's even going to have its own separate page right on our website. So make sure to check out the consulate on diggingcolorado.com. Hi, this is 
it's Jeff Mick from Tony's Markets. Today we're going to work on artichokes. We're starting with a globe artichoke. Globe artichokes are nice because they don't have the little stickers that are going to get you as bad. If you have an artichoke with the stickers, you can just take and cut those outside tips off with your knife. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to split this whole artichoke right down the middle. It's your nice big knife so you're nice and safe. And then it exposes what they call the choke. They call it a choke because it chokes you if you try to eat it. It's full of thistles. It's a really strong thistle. So what we're going to do is I'm going to take a smaller knife. I'm going to cut a semicircle, kind of like a smiley face into this fella and cut that choke out. Now I can just lift and pop that choke out in one piece. Beautiful. This is ready to cook. These will cook in boiling salted water for about 20 or 30 minutes. And then we can grill them. We can serve them with hot with butter. Or in this taste, we're going to stuff it with shrimp or a lot. So stay right there. Dig in. Gardening, cooking, and more. Get the latest advice, tips, and recipes at digincolorado.com. Hi, I'm Neil Sperry, and you're watching just a moment of Dig In DFW, Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex area. This is our landscape, our pecan trees here, big old majestic pecan trees. We've lived here 35 years. My little church in our backyard, the walk made out of antique brick pavers from one of the North Texas streets. You have your own character, your own fun in your part of America. Come see us in Dallas-Fort Worth sometime. Happy gardening from Dig In DFW. Hi, this is Chef Mick from Tony's. We're working with artichokes today. First, we cut the thistle out. I made a little cut here, basically cutting along the bottom of the thistle and popped it out. We've got these two ready here. I've got a little acidulated water. It's got some lemon juice in it and a little bit of salt. We're going to drop them in here. You could also use a steamer. Cover it up and let them cook 20 minutes or so. I'm going to start checking them at 20 minutes. They could take 30, 40 minutes. It all depends on the artichoke and the time of year. So we got that going. We got a little bit of salt here. I'm gonna have, I get a little salted water. Here we go. A little bit of salted water and I'm gonna add some shrimp here. Important to buy shrimp as close as home as possible. Um, there's some that's farm raised in the, in the States. Most of what we get is gonna be from Mexico or South America. Really good quality shrimp that's very sustainable. This is a farm raised shrimp. We also offer really nice wild shrimp from uh, Mexico. This is going to come back to a boil. I'm going to cook it about 60 seconds, take it off, it's going to be done. It does not take long at all to cook these shrimp. All right, we got our shrimp cooked. I pulled all the little tails off, make sure we get all the shell out of it. Drop it in here. If you want, you could cut these smaller, but I like the shrimp kind of big on this dish. We're going to add to it remoulade. Now this is our Tony's homemade remoulade. Um, there's a recipe for this at Tony'sMarket.com. If you want to get, make your own homemade remoulade. But this right here is fully done, just ready to use, just tossing it with the, sh with the shrimp. Very, very simple. And it's kind of a dressing. It's a dressing is kind of in the direction of like a zesty Thousand Island, if you will, or a mayonnaise, uh, a zesty mayonnaise. I've got some that are fully cooked here. These cooked about 20, 20, 25 minutes approximately. They're nice and tender, but they're not so tender that they're squishy. I dropped them in ice water. It chills them off really fast. If you're uh, going to use them right away warm, you don't need to worry about that. You can just let them set and warm, set warm and serve. Other things we could do with this, I could quarter these and season them, put a little Tuscan seasoning on there and grill them. Or you could also, also put just a dab of butter in there while they're hot and just eat the artichoke, pull each leaf off and it's dipping in the sauce as you go. So I've got it right here. I'm gonna, let's start with fixing our salad up a little bit. I'm going to got some fresh greens all out of the garden, of course. I'm going to put a little bit of the... Uh, olive oil on there, a little squeeze of lemon, and then we're just going to garnish it up with some nice grape tomatoes. And I've got some hard boiled egg as a perfect pair with this. Um, I've got some, you know, let's do the black olives here. Black olives around the side, really nice combination with the dressing. Really like it. And then capers, a little bit of caper around the edge, a little bit of lemon zest. Okay. We're going to take our artichoke, set it in here so it's looking nice, and we're going to scoop in the remoulade. Yeah, a little bit more here. I'm going to garnish that with a little bit more of the caper and lemon zest. 
and we're good. You could spike it off with a little bit of chili if you want, but it's ready to go. And if you want a little additional sauce, you could scoop that in there as you go. But we just eat, we can enjoy each leaf with some of the remoulade sauce and a little bit of the shrimp. You can get this recipe and all the recipes today at digincolorado.com. Let's dig in. You know we are gardening professionals. We took a lot of gardening information and put it into 30 minutes. We boiled it down. We did. Chef Mick should be jealous. He should. <laughs> I'd like to thank my buddy Bob at Iris for you for showing us how to divide Iris. And uh, I don't know what you got us into at the consulate house there, but uh, that's going to be a lot of fun over the next year. Uh, and then ending up at uh, Hudson Gardens, what a treat. I mean, that was just a tremendous, a tremendous show of everything they had there. And uh, thanks, Melanie, for running us through, uh, giving us a little bit closer look. And Chef Mick, as always, you gave us a fabulous recipe. For all the information on today's show, make sure you join us and follow us at digincolorado.com. Dig In is brought to you by Tagawa Gardens. 110,000 feet of indoor space with an oasis of lush gardens and plants. Tagawa Gardens is family owned with on staff experts helping our community choose the best annuals, perennials, bushes, trees, and so much more. Tagawa Gardens in Centennial, 7711 South Parker Road, helping our community grow and be green for over 30 years. TagawaGardens.com. Let's roll in. So you know we are professionals because we pause. Where am I? What am I doing? <laughs> I can just say I love Mick. Okay. I guess that sounds better coming from me than you. Dig in Dolorado. Where where are we? That's gonna be a whole year's worth of work. Thanks, MJ. Thank goodness I'm not the only one. <laughs>